Madam Chairman, this conference, focusing its theme on soft power, is undoubtedly very timely. But I'm going to look at a different perspective because soft power can only go so far. And indeed, there are dark times and dark sides when it positively slips. Let's take a look at United Nations soft power, peacekeeping operations. Can it, it can be hugely worthwhile, but there are human frailties. Expectations can be too high. Peacekeeping usually only works in a context of resolved conflict. In unresolved conflicts, they are often produce more problems than they resolve. So, what is the point of peacekeepers if they do not keep the peace? From Rwanda to Bosnia, Haiti to Congo, failures raise questions about UN operations and their mandates. Headlines, just two weeks ago, violence in South Sudan kills three Chinese UN peacekeepers. Similarly afterwards, aid workers were gang raped, a journalist killed, panic calls for help to the nearby UN mission where there were Ethiopian Chinese and Nepalese peacekeepers on standby. But nothing happened. The fact was the armed peacekeepers with armored vehicles couldn't get authorization to leave their base. So what is happening? Overall, in 2016 till this June, 3,499 peacekeepers have been killed. The truth is that peacekeeping, soft power, can pay a very hefty price. And herein lies the dilemma. One of the most vexing issues is the use of force by the United Nations peacekeeping forces. So, United Nations intervention in civil wars such as Somalia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Rwanda, have thrown into stark relief the realities faced by peacekeepers operating in situations where consent to their presence and actives, activities is fragile, to say the least, and where there is little peace to keep. So hence some real failures, and with it, recriminations. Complex questions arise. Is a peace enforcement role for peacekeepers possible, or is it simply war by another name? Should or can the rules of engagement be changed? The United Nations find themselves on a soul-searching mission. How and when should our blue helmeted tro troops respond when civilians are under threat or attacked? Soldiers face different risks today. Terrorist groups, transnational criminal gangs, and hateful ethnic militias all add to the problem. And tasks have become more complicated, increasingly involved with protecting civilians, not, as was the case 20 years ago, keeping warring armies at bay. So the fact is the mandates are not at all clear. Peacekeepers can fire when under personal attack, yet they responded with force in only one case in five when civilians were attacked. Take Rwanda in 1994. The nadir of many lows of UN peacekeeping, hundreds of desperate Tutsis sought refuge at a school where 90 UN troops were based. Surely they were safe. After all, the UN flag flew over the school. The Belgian peacekeepers were armed with a machine gun planted at the entrance. The Tutsis could not imagine they would stand by while people were slaughtered. However, the UN command decided that despite warnings of impending genocide, there were other duties to be done. The peacekeepers were ordered to abandon the school and escort foreigners to the airport and out of the country. As the soldiers left, Tutsis begged to be shot rather than be left to the malicious machetes. Within hours, 2,000 people at the school were murdered by gun, grenade, and blade. Add to that afterwards the fury of the UN commander, Major General Romeo Delaire from Canada, who really was frustrated at the total lack of intelligence as was given to him about impending events. And a year later, matters were even worse. A detachment of Dutch peacekeepers failed to keep a massacre of 8,000 Muslim men in Srebrenica, a supposedly UN safe area. 
they were in fact overwhelmed by sheer numbers. When they did call for help from the French in the era, it was refused. The Dutch were forced to watch as the killings began before they withdrew. The stench of shame about the abandonment has remained to this day. So step forward, Ibrahim Brahimi, with his report in 2000, when he said that the UN had repeatedly failed to meet the challenge, but reforms did begin. The UN produced a new model, including the ethos of responsibility to protect. No longer would UN forces stand idly by while innocent people were murdered, but issues have still brutally persisted. In 2000, British forces landed in Sierra Leone after UN peacekeepers stood aside or fled in advance of the country's capital, Freetown, by a notoriously brutal rebel group, the Revolutionary United Front. Indeed, several hundred Indian peacekeepers actually surrendered to the rebels. A bitter row broke out between the Major General Sir David Richards and the Indian Major General Jetley as to the terms of the engagement. According to Richards, the Indians were determined not to risk or lose a single Indian life. So, hence the importance of clarity with UN peacekeeping missions. They create the illusion of safety and doing something good, but keeping to that is tough. Now, let us take a look at a different area. US soft power in the Middle East. Unintended consequences of the US invasion led the war on to Iraq, in Iraq. After the war, the idea was that soft power would bring stability and democracy. Actually, it did not, as we've seen. Nothing new. Since the end of the Cold War, both Democratic and Republican administrations have believed that soft power and economic incentives can cultivate peaceable democracies through the world and friendly societies adhering to Western liberal values. Even President Obama is correct, though, when he said that, warning that to warn that flexing military muscle is not a stabilizing solution everywhere. Perhaps Iraq best epitomizes the dilemma that terrorism and insurgency pose when soft power does not work. The US can provide air transport, put troops on the ground to defend Baghdad. It may halt the advance of ISIS, but it can't defeat it. Radical ideology is a tough one because it cannot be controlled with a bullet. It will just move elsewhere, such as Syria, for instance. And Russia, on the other hand, takes a robust military view. No soft power here. Like it or not, in their view, the Syrian situation can only end with grinding the people to a standstill. It's very tough for us, outside world, to look at this on sheer humanitarian grounds. In the end, the US must see that no amount of nation building and economic aid will change the Middle East. It has to find its own roadmap, which is painful and frustrating to watch. And sadly, armies still trump economics. The reality is that soft power cannot be a major diplomatic tool. It is only effective when tempered with hard power. So let's look at soft power versus hard propaganda. Which do you trust? for reliable, honest, and independent information. BBC News is the one source that beleaguered people struggle to switch onto their radios. Citizens caught in war zones are desperate to tune into it. They know that the BBC can be trusted and is not pushing a government message. But elsewhere, the dangers of soft power surface in state-orchestrated cultural programs, which often come across as just propaganda. The Pentagon calls it PSYOPs, but the State Department and USAID call it information, all of it intended to influence local populations, so they make no bones about it. The fact is, the US is not shy in using any resources at its disposal. Take the USAID program. Officially, it is an international aid program, and it does indeed do useful work, but there is a darker side. It operates subject to the foreign policy of the President, the Secretary of State, the National Security Council, and add to that, the CIA. Take Cuba. USAID has run a multi-million dollar program disguised as humanitarian aid, but in fact it was intended to incite rebellion in Cuba and overthrow the government using CIA agents posing as tourists and aid workers. 
The fact is that where the US government is hostile to the government of a country, US aid may be asked to undertake programs that the US government cannot be formally associated. This might include support for opposition political movements that seek to remove the government. Such political aid is criticized as being incompatible with USAID's humanitarian role. Similarly, the engagement with US military has been severely criticized for exposing USAID workers to the dangers of military combat. For all that, the US government overall has no qualms for political aid and joint civ civilian military programs to go ahead in the interest of US geopolitical interests and to build democracy. They can also have def uh, influence at the United Nations. The US can use aid as a political weapon. Take the Yemen. In 1990, the Yemeni ambassador to the UN voted against a resolution for a US-led coalition to use force against Iraq. The US ambassador, Thomas Pickering, walked over to the Yemeni ambassador and retorted, that was the most expensive no vote you ever cast. Immediately afterwards, US aid ceased operations and funding Yemen. As for Iraq, this time there is no pretense that the US aid's budget of $5 billion included a massive sum devoted to setting up democratic elections. In hindsight, voting played a limited role in reconciling religious divisions or combating corruption. But let's take China. China has a different tack. For China, soft power means trade as well as development programs. China is trading with the Philippines at the rate of $60 billion a year. But soft power merges into hard power as China seeks to consolidate its position in the region. In 1994, in an attempt to claim disputed territory in the South China Seas, China built a massive military base on Mischief Reef, well within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Philippines could not respond militarily to this provocation, but after a series of incidents, it took the matter for adjudication to the UN International Tribunal in The Hague. The finding came down overwhelmingly in favor of the Philippines. Beijing firmly rejected the finding. And the matter is unlikely to rest there. Soft power in the South China Seas has turned into hard power. Military spending is up, both on the China side and the US. Manila has sought more US military funding and made its bases more accessible to US forces. So long as China continues to harbor a highly aggressive military strategy in the South China Sea, its soft power initiatives will appear ineffective and illegitimate. So what about Chinese aid and the development programs? Are there any strings attached? First, no questions are asked about the host government. It could be murderous, autocratic, but the Chinese policy unlike the US and Russia, takes no part in internal politics, no matter how unsavory they may be. The aid comes in all, shorts, all shapes and forms, some complete loans, debt relief, deferred long-term repayments, above all, development finance, which blurs aid with trade. The Chinese are building everywhere, the biggest mosque in North Africa. They are building, they built hydropower state, hydropower stations, stadiums, hospitals, schools, provide goods and materials, technical cooperation, medical humanitarian assistance, and so on. There's little published data, but it is believed there are nearly 3,000 development projects in 51 African countries. In other words, 45% of their entire aid program. That is influence. They've overtaken US aid programs by a very large margin. In truth, aid, Development finance and commerce pr programs have merged China. And what is finding now is that China being utterly professional in their approach. The businessmen arrived well equipped to the task they've got, well equipped with language skills, and brilliant negotiators. Awesome, to the point that generally the contract is in their favor rather than elsewhere. Finally, let us take a look at Russia. Their propaganda machine has scaled great heights. President Putin manipulates the local media mercilessly. Now he's turning it to the global audiences. The state-run news agency Sputnik has opened its first British bureau for Russia Today TV, known as RT, using Edinburgh in Scotland as its base. 
Through this medium, the West is portrayed as decadent, plagued by racism and constantly betrayed by its elected uh, representatives. If the Russians can sow divisions, they will. They chose Scotland in the hopes that a divided Britain will be less obstructive to the Kremlin. They dislike intensely the UK for being a vociferous member of the UN Security Council and champion for sanctions against Putin. Hence, the campaign is part of Russia's military doctrine, which specifies the use of informational and other non-military measures. We have already witnessed them hacking into the Democratic Party, releasing 20,000 stolen emails, many of them embarrassing to US party leaders, giving rise to the suspicion that Russia is trying to subvert the US presidential elections and gather support for Donald Trump, who already has close commercial links in Russia. In short, the Russia's propaganda mission is to sow doubt about incumbent governments and undermine trust wherever they can operate. Like the US, they bankroll the political parties they prefer, such as Marine Le Pen's National Fund, and have contacts through proxy organizations with populist parties across Europe. Their misinformation in Ukraine reached new heights when they claimed that the Malaysian civil airline shot down over eastern Ukraine huh, by Russian weapons fired by Russian-trained men was in fact the work of the Ukraine government. And they, indeed, they do extremely well in post-Soviet states where they work on groups where Russia is the dominant language. There, they can exploit residual Soviet sentiment. This has particularly unnerved the Baltic states, who are already extremely unsettled by the military exercises taking place offshore. So therefore, when it comes to Russian propaganda, there is no option. When they come on stream, every single misinformation and statement has to go and be challenged all the way. So my conclusion is this. Soft power has indeed become a very bitter battleground. In the end, I believe that soft power inevitably ends up hard, thus becoming a paradox. Tangible power is all that matters, not intentions. Entry into a country's psyche via culture has its inherent limits. Soft power, in my view, cannot prevent war. Idealists believe that culture and trade can create a relationship, the two lasting pillars of stability, but the fact is, we cannot identify a single isolated or rogue power state which has responded positively. Soft power and restructuring did not solve the Middle East. So sanctions also do not work, and I do believe that it needs a complete rethink. In the end, my instinct is this. Real politics means that a country must be very clear in its own mind about what returns they expect to emerge from a massive investment in soft power. It can be immensely positive, but not in the face of a bullying power. Real politics means being firm and clear about your position, then roll in soft power and all its benefits. Thank you, Madam Chairman.